My name is Scott Kennedy. I'm a, a senior advisor in the Freeman Chair here at CSIS and also director of our project on Chinese business and political economy. And I'm delighted that everybody is in my neighborhood to talk about a really interesting topic uh, that I pay attention to 24-7, 365. Not quite as often as FedEx planes are in the sky, but just about, I think. Um, and, and certainly not with the same level of efficiency. Uh, but we're here today to continue the conversation that we started uh, next door uh, with Fred Smith and Hank Paulson uh, uh, about a positive uh, trade agenda with a particular focus on China. Uh, and we have two uh, eminent experts on this topic uh, to discuss the, the question of how to uh, deal with, with China. But b before uh, I, they, I, I let them loose and then have the conversation with all of you, I just want to give just a little bit more of a context to link the conversation that we started next door to the conversation here. Because a lot of times you can have a conversation about China which is just China, 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 and never figure out what the relationship is to anything else. And given how big China is, that's easy to do and no one will complain. But we have a larger uh, story to deal with. And that's the question of a positive trade agenda. And we didn't define what a positive trade agenda is uh, next door, uh, but I imagine that if we did, I'll just offer one, it would have three components. It would involve low barriers to trade and investment, uh, limited government intervention in the domestic economy, and the use of commonly accepted institutions to set and enforce rules amongst the participants. I think it would contain those three things. Um, the question is, what do you do when you have a recalcitrant participant in this system? and particularly one that is very, very large and may be the largest participant in the system that is not necessarily accepting of those three elements of a positive trade agenda. How do you deal with them? Uh, well, the historic answer for the United States has, has been engagement, um, dialogue, discussion, uh, integration. But what if that doesn't seem to be working or at least working as much as you want it to be, then what do you do? Um, do you throw up your hands in the air? Do you look for some alternative? Uh, that's the topic of today uh, in this conversation in the context of our overall uh, conversation here at CSIS uh, this morning. Uh, luckily, we have two uh, wonderful experts who have agreed to share their insights uh, with us to get the conversation going. Uh, David Dollar is a senior fellow with the Brookings Institution's uh, John Thornton Center on China Studies. Uh, he served in the U.S. Embassy as the senior attache for the Treasury Department on all issues financial involving the U.S.-China relationship. And he served for 20 years at the World Bank uh, and for a while headed uh, the World Bank's uh, research and programming vis-a-vis -vis China and Mongolia. Uh, to my right is Ambassador Jorge Guajardo, who uh, manages McLarty Associates' uh, operations and advisory uh, activities with regard to China and Latin America. He served for six years as Mexico's ambassador to China uh, and probably knows more about uh, China at a macro level and at a day-to-day -day level, uh, in front of the curtain, behind the curtain, than just about anybody uh, I've ever met. Uh, both of them uh, have followed China for a very long time, uh, but uh, they don't have the same opinion about what we ought to do, which is a good thing to get the conversation going. Uh, what I hope we will do is, is first identify where they differ, but then try and come back and see where we may have some uh, common ground. I think one of the big challenges in the debate over China the last several years is talking past one another. Oftentimes, it's the United States and China talking past one another. But oftentimes, it's folks just within the policy community in the United States talking past one another. We want to make sure that it's not just simply a difference of definitions or focusing on one thing as opposed to the other. Uh, today, we're supposed to try and come up with some solutions, uh, not just lay out the problems uh, as well. So, so that's what we need to do. 
identify the differences, identify areas of common ground, and see what policy solutions we, we might, might come to. And we've got to do that in only 55 more minutes. So, um, so um, no small feat. Uh, so let me first turn uh, to David, then I'll turn to Ambassador Guajardo, uh, and then we'll open up the floor for not a Q&A, but a conversation, uh, as Bill Reinch said before. So David, uh, welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Scott. Great pleasure to be here. Great to debate the issue of engagement or decoupling between the United States and China. So let me open with five short points. The first, I just want to stipulate that the China does a lot of things in the world that are against U.S. interests. The obvious examples would be militarization of the South China Seas, treatment of Uyghurs and Tibetans, cyber theft of commercial secrets. So I want to be eyes wide open. My second point is that China does a lot of good in the world, and I would put that mostly under the category of global public goods. You know, so China is contributing to the effort to control climate change and reduce carbon emissions. Uh, China, we would never have gotten the Iran nuclear deal without China's cooperation. You wouldn't be having Kim Jong-un meeting with Donald Trump in Hanoi right now if you didn't have China's cooperation, so nuclear nonproliferation. We often have good cooperation with China on public health, and I would argue that China has played a positive role in development and poverty reduction in the developing world. So I think there are a lot of positive areas where we collaborate with China, and that's important background. Then third, to turn more specifically to the topic here, my third point is that we have quite a bit of economic engagement between the U.S. and China. I don't think we should exaggerate it, but we have, I would call, a moderate amount of integration, certainly far more than we ever had with the Soviet Union back during the Cold War period. <clears throat> and I would argue the economic engagement is mutually beneficial. This is what we've lost sight of in the United States. Both exports and imports are benefits, and America benefits from the economic exchange with China. If you want to get more specific, almost anyone who has a college degree in the United States has had their real income raised by trading with China. Now, it's true this trade has distributional consequences. It puts downward pressure on wages for semi-skilled manufacturing workers. That's, that's the nature of trade. It enhances some returns and it reduces others. That's an issue. That's an issue for Germany as well. Germany's done a good job with retraining and with various safety net programs that help communities and people adjust. America's done a poor job of spreading the benefits of trade. So one thing to think about is if we've done a poor job of spreading the benefits, do we want to stop trading or do we want to learn from other countries and do a better job with retraining, adjustment assistance, et cetera? But in this debate, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the economic relationship is a net benefit for the United States. And that's true despite all the concerns. You know, we just heard a nice speech from Hank Paulson. There are definitely issues of market access and intellectual property rights protection. So we can uh, improve the relationship but we benefit from the relationship as it stands right now. That brings me to my fourth point, that decoupling the United States and the Chinese economies would have serious costs because we benefit from the relationship. And here I want to emphasize that those costs will be even greater for our allies. There are 144 countries that have more trade with China than the United States, including 50 countries in Africa, and every country in Asia except Afghanistan and Bhutan. So when I travel both Africa and Asia, what I hear over and over again is countries do not want to have to choose between China and the United States. So if we take a program or a path of decoupling, we're going to be forcing countries to choose. We shouldn't assume that most of these countries are going to choose to go with us. They already have more trade with China, and that's likely to expand in the future. And the Secretary mentioned that China's trade surplus has come way down. The broadest measure of the current account is actually less than one half of 1% of GDP. So China has trade deficits with large numbers of countries. Lots of countries are selling to China. That's an important part of their development strategy. If we try to decouple, we're going to end up isolating ourselves. And then my last point is that we can certainly do a better job with engagement. So I don't view the current situation as ideal. And at the risk of oversimplification, I would say that a lot of ways in which we could do a better job with engagement would be if we had a more multilateral approach. 
So, for example, we should rejoin the Paris Agreement, we should rejoin the Iran Accord, we should rejoin the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we should join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and double down on our support of multilateral development banks. We should work with like-minded countries who are trying to reform the World Trade Organization. So I think we have a global system that works reasonably well, that, but that can be improved. If the U.S. tries to withdraw from that, that's going to leave China. I mean, China is going to engage with all these institutions. They're deeply embedded in all these institutions, except Trans-Pacific Partnership, of which they're not a member. But China is going to continue to engage. If we pull back, we're basically just leaving China the field to develop regulations and rules for the future, rather than us continuing to play a leading role. Thank you very much. Super. Excellent. Uh statement in defense of uh, engagement. Uh, thank you, David, very much. Uh, we'll turn to Ambassador Guajardo. Well, well, thank you, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. Just a, the way to approach this, we, we think of a engagement or decoupling. Of course, engagement is a political issue and decoupling is a commercial issue. So they may not be mutually exclusive. Uh, the problem with arguing uh, disengagement is that there are truisms in life uh, that are hard to counter. It is better to have friends than to have enemies. It is better to listen than to talk. It is better to engage than to isolate. So anytime you make an argument against engagement, it's a counter argument and it, and, and it uh, brings this awkward reaction on people. Why would you not want to engage? And I think that is something that China has been gaming to its advantage for many years. I think uh, China thrives on engagement, China thrives on process, and in the process, I mean, thrives in the process of engagement, in the dialogues, et cetera, and in the process takes advantage of commercial uh, issues to the point that they rightly tie engagement with commercial coupling. After spending six years in China, I left uh, convinced that it was best to break engagement with China in order to shock the system. And that is something that was not popular then and that we've seen recently with President Trump. Now, uh, I'm a Mexican, so I don't have to explain my feelings uh, regarding President Trump. <laughs> Nevertheless, I, I must... Uh, I must admit I was somewhat excited when I saw his approach to China for the simple reason that he quickly broke with the traditional engagement mechanisms. And that's what I think brought China to the table. And, that, and I think there is an argument to be made in favor of that. And so when he first stopped the dialogues, uh, the strategic and economic dialogue, et cetera, I think it stopped the mechanism for China to continue postponing issues or things they had to address. When he started raising tariffs, levying tariffs on Chinese imports, I think it forced China to, to face the fact that they no longer had time. And I think for the first time in decades, China has come to the realization that they do need to make considerable concessions in order to maintain the, their privileged trading position in the world, and I think that's no small thing, and that all comes through the process of disengagement, not decoupling. Decoupling is a more difficult proposition because there are supply chains, they are difficult to, to alter, so I'm not ready to make a case for decoupling. I am ready to make a case for disengagement as a pressure point, and I'll use a, a couple of examples that we're living uh, one today, and that is the case that China traditionally used to bring its role in the engagement process as a holistic approach, including commercial. So you could not levy tariffs or you could not take, uh, you could not take countermeasures against Chinese uh, unfair trading practices because they would always tie it with their uh, contribution to the climate change uh, talks to the to Korea's uh, issue, and that was something they always used to sort of uh, blackmail uh, the United States and the world community uh, so that they would not be held accountable. 
I think one of the things that uh, set President Trump aside was the fact that he pulled out of the Paris uh, Agreement, not something I agree with, but something that definitely shook uh, China, and simply said, oh, I'll talk to Kim Jong-un directly. I don't need China for that. So even though they are cooperating, there is no doubt that they feel sidelined. So all of a sudden, China had to face the fact that they were going to face the issue of commercial transactions strictly on their merits, not on the other issues they said they were contributing to. And I think that gave uh, the United States an advantage in, in their negotiations with China. I think it's the first time that China has been brought to the negotiating table in a serious way. Unfortunately, that may have changed recently because of uh, the way President Trump has been talking publicly about the negotiations. But nevertheless, I think this engagement in this case has been favorable to the overall commercial relation uh, with China and the rest of the world. And mind you, it's one of the few areas probably in which the U.S. has been able to, to build an alliance uh, during the Trump years. It's one of the few issues in which there is bipartisan support in Washington. And, and that sort of tells you how far China had come along in gaming this whole engagement process to its advantage and how shaking that was surprising to, to China, but not necessarily disadvantageous to, to the rest of the world. Thank you very much, uh, Jorge. That's uh, uh, terrific. And I, I think uh, what I take from your initial comments um, is that we need to think of disengagement or divorce or, or sort of two different issues, at, at least. One has to do with sort of the economic reality of, of how much interaction there is with the economies. And the second is um, what's the method by which we interact with the Chinese from a policy or political perspective to get what we want, right? And I think what you're focusing on is, is that um, simply sitting down in the institutionalized mechanisms of the past gave too much comfort to the Chinese. So uh, knocking them off their base, uh, uh, disrupting the standard procedure, uh, including with uh, tariff threats, is, is an effective way uh, to uh, get their attention and hopefully uh, improve the relationship. So you're not saying disengage economically, you're saying use different strategy in terms of how we negotiate. That is absolutely right. That's exactly what I'm saying. The fact that uh, President Trump just took everything aside and said, we will deal with you strictly on commercial issues and started setting deadlines shook China to its core because they were used to kicking the can down the road and using the, all these engagement processes, the strategic and economic dialogue, the UN conferences, everything, to, to continue their dialogue and postponing and saying, you know, we're building towards something even though it's never here, we're building towards it, so it's to your advantage to continue talking. And all of a sudden, when you break that, it finally brings them down to the realization that they actually have to, to sit down and start making quick concessions because there's a timeline. However, I do, again, I go on the basis that China thrives on process. Anytime there's process, China will be winning. And I think that just recently, after the Buenos Aires uh, summit, they have been somewhat successful in bringing things back into process by saying, you know, pushing the deadline to March 1st and now pushing it again to a later date, they're now in their in the field where they're comfortable, which is process. We're talking, you know, we have later meetings, and then maybe there's a meeting at Mar-a-Lago, so now we, we have another one to look forward to. And as long as there's progress, they will always frame that as saying, we should build towards something, and that's where they thrive in gaming the system. Um, uh, thanks for the elaboration. Let me, let me so if I can push both of you a little bit, uh, to, to make sure that we touch all bases here on, on the question of the economic engagement. Um, I get, you know, under Xi Jinping, China's really ramped up state capitalism, right? Um, I mean, maybe you disagree with, with me, which is, which is fine. But uh, relative to previous leaders, uh, you know, China's more interventionist, the amount of credit going to uh, State-owned companies relative to the private sector has shifted significantly, as Nick Lardy's book recently shows. Uh, made in China 2025, uh, the goals that they have for these different industries. Uh, you know, uh, and China's not shy about 
uh, pursuing these goals, uh, even, uh, and for them, sometimes win-win doesn't mean 50-50, it means 99-1, right? Um, so I guess my question would be, D David, to you and, and also to Jorge, uh, is there anything that the Chinese could do where you would say, you know, enough's enough, economic disengagement, we are just not benefiting enough. There's, there's, we're, there's some folks benefiting, but we are, uh, you know, getting taken to the cleaners. We are losing our IP. We are losing our, our values and other things. Are, are we, what would it take for the Chinese uh, to get you to decide, you know, what, is, this marriage ain't going to work out. We're going to need a divorce. Right. So I don't agree with the narrative that on the economic side, we're getting taken to the cleaners. I think, you know, there's this mistaken dialogue or narrative in Washington that you look at the trade balance and that tells you who's winning or losing. And that's basically ignores the benefits of imports. The whole point of international trade is to both export and import. In the long run, these things tend to even out. So I don't agree with the narrative that China's taking us to, you know, that we're uh, losing out to China. And there definitely are issues of intellectual property rights protection, for example. But if you look at international indices of IPR protection, China's slightly better than other big emerging markets like Brazil or India. It's not fundamentally different. China's actually many similar in a lot of ways to what we went through with Taiwan and South Korea at an earlier stage. So I don't see this as, as a fundamentally new thing. In terms of the relative weight of the private sector and the state sector in China, still a largely private economy. I think what's happened since the global financial crisis is, as Secretary mentioned, China is much less dependent on exports, which is, I think, a healthy trend. In order to sustain their economy, they've put a lot of resources into local infrastructure, which tends to you know, involve lending to local governments. And so you definitely see in the statistics some shifting of credit toward those local government enterprises. Biggest thing you see in the statistics on lending is the rise of mortgage lending to households. Right? So I would argue it's, it's still a complex picture of both private and public sector, and I don't think there's been a big structural change in the last few years uh, that, that suddenly this is more of a state capitalist system. I think it continues to be a mixed private-public system. And now to answer your question without getting too long-winded, I don't really think there's anything on the economic side that would make me think that we're not benefiting from continuing trade and investment with China. You know, when we take these IPR worries, for example, our companies have corporate profits at an all-time high. They continue to invest in R&D at the same rates. They continue to patent at the same rates. There's a whole bunch of macroeconomists who argue about, you know, why the U.S. economy has slowed down over time. No one in that group says, oh, China competition is hurting the United States. That's not serious. The economists just don't really take that seriously. But I don't want to be too much of a panda hugger here, Scott. So th there are... Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, there are, there are, there are important things. The, the, to me, the obvious one is if, if mainland China invades Taiwan, then, then that we're going to have to totally reevaluate the whole relationship. So I think there are things that can happen in the global security sphere that would get us to reevaluate the relationship. But on the economic side, you know, I, I think a lot of the complaints from the United States are really rather small potatoes. So I, I think this will be the first uh, issue with which we, in which we find common ground. I also don't think the U.S. is being taken to the cleaners. I don't think uh, deficits are per se a measure of, uh, being taken to, of winning or losing. Uh, I would use a, a benchmark, uh, Scott, to your question on what China would have to do to, to demonstrate that it is uh, competing on an equal basis uh, with the United States. And I would go to pre cepheus and FIRMA reform and, say, and just say market access. Anything, if there is any sector or area in which China can invest or participate participate economically in the United States that a U.S. company is not allowed to do in China, then that is a red flag. So I would just very simply ask for reciprocity. Now, can I say, so this is another area of agreement. So before the last presidential election, I argued that the U.S. You know, had reason to take a tougher stand toward China economically. It made sense to do it in the investment realm, which is where a lot of China restrictions are. The problem with using tariffs is they're clearly hurting the U.S. economy. So, Jorge, you were kind of hinting that we're probably not going to get much of a deal with China, and 
That's because the tool we've used is hurting the U.S. economy, and so now the president seems to be backing away from that. I, I, actually, my hinting is I think the president has lost uh, the, the narrative advantage by sort of uh, emphasizing that we're reaching a, a deal uh, by focusing too much on the stock market. Uh, evidently, there's been pressure from the ag state. So I think he has lost some of the narrative, and I think the Chinese might have uh, taken his measure in the sense that he needs a deal. He, he needs to come out successful. So they're, therefore, I'm afraid they may not be as pressured to, to make important concessions. There are very clear concessions. And again, uh, look at all these U.S. companies uh, applying for permits to operate in China, and they're not getting them. So it's very simple. Anyone, any company that has a permit uh, pending to operate in China and is being blocked by all these intricate non-tariff barriers, I think should be uh, a breaking point. Um. I'm going to use the prerogative of, of sitting in between you guys to say a couple things just about the small potatoes, because I, 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 and I think that's a conversation that we, we should have with everyone else, and then I want to open it up with everyone and, and of course, give you guys a chance to surprise. Um, I would agree, uh, and I think uh, probably most, most people looking at it, that the bilateral trade balance in goods isn't a good measure of whether China's playing fair or not, right? Um, and uh, Commerce Department just released uh, year-end data at, uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, it'll come out with China numbers. It doesn't have China numbers yet, but the China, the bilateral trade deficit in goods will be over $400 billion. It was $375 billion last year. I don't think that's a really good measure of whether China's playing fair or whether we're winning or losing. Uh, I do think it's, it's, it's going to be noticed at the at the industry level, at the company level, whether you've got market access or not. Of course, your sales may grow 5% over last year, but if you should have a lot bigger piece of the pie, then there's still a lot of pie you're leaving, uh, or some of the potatoes that you, that you don't have access to, or the sour cream and butter. Um, and, uh, and, and then there's the issue of whether China's state capitalist system generates externalities for the global economy in terms of overcapacity, uh, low productivity, uh, cheapening of IP. That isn't necessarily a con uh, something that hurts individual companies in China, but maybe hurts the global economy in general, uh, which is a, potentially a reason why one would want to take, uh, you know, uh, s some, some steps. But let me, uh, I don't want to belabor that point, but I want to ask more about um, uh, Jorge's point about not, not full-scale divorce, but, um, you know, having some of the family members not be able to interact with each other, which is, I think, another way to think about reciprocity. So if uh, AWS and Microsoft and others can't do offer cloud in China, then um, Chinese Alibaba, Tencent shouldn't be able to have cl cloud services here. If, if FedEx can't take any package to any point in China by themselves 100%, then Shunfeng and any other Chinese logistics company should just be stopped at the border and hand off to FedEx uh, in LA. Uh, if uh, China, if uh, MasterCard and Visa can't, offer credit cards and electronic payment services in China. China Union Pay should just, all those ATMs ought to just be shut down uh, in, until we get that. What, what about something like that? Is, is that, is that uh, a reasonable middle ground between full engagement and, and uh, you know, uh, disengagement? I mean, I've advocated that for several years. I, I wouldn't make the reciprocity simplistic and knee-jerk but most of the examples you just mentioned, Scott, I would be in favor of restrictions from the U.S. side. Remember, we, you know, our enhanced CFIUS process can do a lot of this, right? We could make decisions about cloud and certainly about electronic payments based on national security grounds. Uh, so I, I propose the idea that we should be very uh, unwelcoming to Chinese state enterprises investing in the U.S. because the presumption of the benefit you get from foreign investment, I don't see it there with Chinese state enterprises, right? So, you know, I think, um, you know, getting tougher on investment as we're starting to do actually has a certain logic, and there are no global rules on investment. The thing about the tariffs that bothers me, it, as it said, it's hurting our own economy, and we're actually violating the WTO, and I think in the long run that's going to come back and haunt us. So, yes, I do agree with that uh, reciprocity benchmark, and 
if U.S. journalists cannot get visas to work in China, I think Chinese journalists should not be granted visas to work in the United States. I mean, there are many issues in which you can, if a think tank uh, scholars cannot uh, get visas to go to China, I think Chinese uh, scholars should not be granted visas to come to the United States. I think it is hard to argue on the Chinese side against reciprocity because it's a very simple argument in the, in the sense that you will not uh, let us do the same. And that's where China best games the system, in, in which they have their cake and eat it too. Or as, I mean, you refer to win-win. When I was there, we, we used to refer it as China wins twice. And, and, and that is often the case. So yes, I do think reciprocity is a good uh, starting point just to, to evaluate where the relationship is. And I think uh, we stand to be surprised by how disadvantageous it is to anyone but China. In my role as panda hugger, let me come back on that. You know, the large number of our big corporations earn a third to a half of their profits in China. So that they would like to have a better environment, they'd like to have more openness, better intellectual property rights protection, but given the current situation, they're investing, they're earning a lot of profits there, and they're benefiting from the relationship. They do so uh, as long as they have the favor of the Communist Party. The minute they lose that uh, favorability, whether it be the case of Lotte from South Korea or whether it be a Carrefour from France or U.S. companies that may be subjected or Marriott or Delta or Mercedes-Benz that they incur uh, the wrath of the Communist Party, then they stand to, to lose that market uh, advantage they have in China. And I think that in itself is proof of how disadvantageous this is. We have plenty of uh, meat and potatoes on the table right now uh, with sour cream and butter to go and, and hopefully some chives. Um, it's telling you lunch is coming, uh, I hope. Um, all right, um, I, I think the, 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 let's open up the, the dialogue uh, to everybody uh, and see if we can come up with uh, some consensus or areas of where we disagree uh, about uh, the relationship about econ economic engagement, uh, what are we willing to accept or not accept, uh, given what the Chinese might do, and, and the process of, of dealing with the Chinese, um, uh, you know, uh, going unilateral as opposed to uh, engagement through these institutionalized mechanisms. Uh, who wants to uh, jump in first? Uh, just feel free to raise your hand and uh, We'll, 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 we'll see where the conversation goes. We don't have a preordained outcome. That's the purpose of this, yes.
Uh, super, very much. I'm, I'm welcome to have both of you co comment on that. I, I could talk about. I, I could talk for hours on this subject, and I and I think it, uh, China's presence in the world is the biggest nothing burger out there. And when I first arrived in Washington, I remember there were all these panels of China in Latin America, and I would just go in and, and listen and play the role of the policeman in a crime scene saying, keep walking, there's nothing to see here. Because there really is nothing to see there. There is China presence, somewhat, but there's not Chinese influence. I have yet to see a country in the world that wants to be closer or emulate China in order to have a bigger Chinese presence the way I see them with the United States. Mind you, all of this gets more complicated during the Trump administration because soft power is a little bit edgier when it comes to the United States around the world. But nevertheless, I have... I do not think China is making inroads through its uh, BRI, uh, Belt and Road. thank you, <laughs> Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, I, I don't think uh, the, the fear there is that China is gaining uh, geopolitical allies around the world uh, through its so-called soft power is actually panning out. So I don't uh, worry much about that. Well, let me just say, I think the situation is quite different in Africa. I mentioned that there are 50 African countries that have more trade with China than with the U.S., and African countries are getting very significant financing from China for infrastructure development. About a third of the foreign financing for infrastructure in Africa comes from China. A lot of this is in countries that are relatively democratic and de have decent governance. I visited projects in Uganda, Tanzania, haven't visited South Africa recently, but that's another good example. And these are the leaders from here, whom I hear you know, this, this, essentially this, this worry on their part that they're going to be forced to choose between the United States and China because they feel like they're getting some benefit from the trade and investment with China, but they're aware of a lot of the pitfalls and they want to have a good relationship with the United States, particularly on the security side. And, and so the question is, why would we force Uganda to choose between China and the United States? Now, if we are worried about some aspects of the Chinese financing, we should get back in the game and provide more financing for infrastructure in the developing world. We set up the original development banks, World Bank, et cetera. They've mostly gotten out of the business of infrastructure financing for a variety of reasons that kind of go beyond our panel. But if we were serious, I mean, we're still the biggest shareholder in World Bank, most of these development banks. You know, we could get these banks back into infrastructure financing which would be helpful to countries and which would have a spillover effect, I think, in improving the Chinese financing. You know, Secretary Paulson mentioned we often hear these statistics about the tremendous poverty reduction in the world. One thing to keep in mind is a lot of that's in China, so China's benefited. Okay, so put that aside. There's been tremendous poverty reduction in the rest of the developing world, and there's like a very clear transition point around 1990. And this is definitely related to China's rise. China has provided demand and financing for a lot of the developing world. So we have to understand that China's popular in a lot of parts of the developing world because of the impact of its economy, which has been beneficial in many of these locations. Um, both helpful. I, I just want to make sure that we um, cross the T's and dot the I's with respect to this gentleman's point, which I think the question is, should we compete or cooperate with China in, in uh, developing countries, in, in, including in Africa? Should we, set, should we not only increase our, the availability of funding that we provide, but set conditions with regard to governance and standards and things like that? And if the Chinese uh, invite the Chinese to participate, and if they don't, then do everything to discourage uh, countries from taking money which, uh, or support which might not meet the types of standards which we'd want to promote. I think that's... That, that's sort of the engagement or, or competition sort of uh, out in third countries level. So I, I think that's um, the, the nub of the issue. Right? But, uh, so, so I would point out that, you, that if, you know, if you look across Africa, you have big variations in governance. In general, the U.S. is involved in the countries that have better governance. That's the basis for our participation in a lot of things. So, and that's how we expect the World Bank and the banks that we're involved in. To, to operate. So I think it's natural for the U.S. to cooperate with China, you know, in the countries that we've decided have reasonably good governance, and you know, those countries want to have good projects, they want to have sustainable debt, et cetera. And then I'm not sure how we stop Chinese activity in Angola, for example, or Sudan, 
But already those countries are running into serious debt problems, so you know, I think it's kind of a natural experiment. China's going to fail in the countries that have very poor governance, and it's not a bad thing if we help them be part of the success in countries like Uganda, Tanzania, Eastern Africa. Uh, I think just sort of totally separating the U.S. effort from the Chinese effort I don't think it's realistic, and I don't think it's going to have the best effect. Okay. All right. Next, next comment. We'll, we'll come here. Uh, I uh, neglected to ask folks just to identify yourselves when you make your comments and contributions. We'll come here. Yes. Um, I was wondering, obviously, because we don't have the same sort of international investment regime that we have for trade. We do have more freedom to pursue some sort of reciprocity, but if we pursue it unilaterally, is it, is it going to work? I, I, think, I think it does work. I think it brings uh, China to the table. I mean, the U.S. is the number one destination uh, for Chinese investment or the, the desired destination. Uh, so the fact that you put limits on it, that's what brings them to the table. That's what gets their attention. Uh, and I'll let David answer. I agree. I think the U.S. is, the, you know, we're the biggest recipient of direct foreign investment. We're the biggest market, and we're technologically advanced. And if, if we, as we are doing, if we have more restrictions on Chinese investment in the U.S., it has definitely caught their attention. You know, I would argue that's definitely caught their attention. Uh, just, to, just to follow up with Anna's question and your initial comments. So last year, Chinese investment dropped like a rock. Right. Yeah. Partly uh, as a result of our concerns, partly as a result of China's deleveraging campaign and worries about credit as a whole, um, and certainly. Uh, but that didn't lead China to open up their investment doors a lot. I mean, maybe maybe we'll get that by in, the, in this new agreement. But are we? Is it possible that China would say, you know what? Uh, we may not be able to invest abroad anymore, but we're, we're still not going to open the door. We, we'd rather have everyone limit investment than, than force us to, to let AWS operate entirely uh, f uh, you know, across China and, and places like that. Well, if the OECD calculates an index of FDI restrictiveness by country by sector. And according to that OECD index, China has been gradually opening up more sectors. It's about the same as South Korea 20 years ago, so I think we should keep perspective. There are lots of sectors where you have 100 percent foreign ownership in China. That's where most of their exports come from, are the sectors where you have 100 percent foreign ownership. And I would argue recently you've got BMW with, with a full ownership of a factory in China. You've got some aspects of financial services. So they're gradually opening up. This is a good moment. We're pushing on a door that can open because their own technocrats understand that this is key to creating more dynamism in their economy. Okay. And to, to that point, I think, uh, yes, I think you can push China to open uh, foreign investment. And I think two months ago, uh, the stage was set for that before President Trump, uh, Trump uh, started showing his hand uh, in the negotiations. And, and you saw Tesla also have 100% uh, investment in its operation in China. And I think they they were in the understanding that they needed to open several sectors. They were already talking about them. I think they've now sort of uh, held back because they, they think they can get away with it. But I think that should be where, where you should focus on. I can predict, for example, in electric cars, uh, to promote Chinese electric cars, they're going to say, if, if uh, international logistics companies want to deliver directly in China, might, might you buy some of uh, your fleet from our electric, domestic electric car companies? I could, I could see uh, someone sending a letter to um, Memphis soon with that suggestion. Uh, let's go uh, next. We'll go, come right here in the middle. Um, I'm Shihoko Goto with the Wilson Center. I want to turn to the poison pill clause of USMCA. And for Ambassador Guajardo in particular, how palatable is that about um, the vetoing power of member countries from negotiating with China if that were to be the case? Um, does that help in pursuing uh, structural reform within China, or does that actually hurt the Mexican economy more in isolating China? Um, and to um, David Dollar, the question is, there is expectation that the administration would pursue this kind of poison pill clause in negotiating with um, bilateral agreements with other countries moving forward. 
how does that, um, d does that actually enhance China's, um, force China to change its own um, governance more, or does that actually hurt U.S. relations with its partner countries? What is the benefit of it? So uh, the question is regarding the po poison pill and the USMCA, the NAFTA 2.0 agreement in which none of the three countries can sign a free trade agreement with a non-market economy country without giving six month notice to the other two countries. That is known as the anti-China uh, poison pill. Uh, China, of course, being considered the non-market economy referred to. My only regret about that poison pill is that it was not Mexico's proposal. I think no country stands to benefit uh, more from it than Mexico. Uh, Mexico was a country most displaced by China when China joined the WTO. Mexico was the last country to come on board signing uh, China's accession into WTO. There is absolutely no appetite in Mexico to sign a free trade agreement uh, with China at all. We're not complementary economies, zero complementarity. So if anyone benefited from that poison pill, it was Mexico because it sort of gives us a lock into the North American uh, market. I think the only country that somewhat had expressed uh, an intent to sign a free trade agreement with China was Canada, and that was during Prime Minister Trudeau's uh, visit uh, two Decembers ago, in which he had a values-led uh, or principles-led uh, uh, approach to free trade. It was left out of the room by the Chinese, never got anywhere. Uh, it's it's a non-binding clause because it allows any of the three NAFTA countries to define non-market, uh, what constitutes non-market. It's not under the WTO rules. So it's non-binding. Nevertheless, I think politically it is helpful. It's sort of a, either you're with us or you're against us, and Mexico benefits with that. Right. So I would say in terms of the agreements China's signing, you know, for example, it has a free trade agreement with Australia. These are generally what I think of as pretty weak agreements. You know, they don't cover a lot of these issues that we're concerned with, intellectual property rights or services or investment. They don't cover these in any substantial way. So you could argue they're, they're really not, you know, they're not that important. They kind of lock in mutual market access. You know, Australia exports a lot to China. It's got a very large trade surplus with China. You know, Australia was happy to uh, lock in the status quo, but I don't think these are, these are not advancing openness essentially in these economies and I view them as kind of a distraction away from uh, you know some larger agreement like Trans-Pacific Partnership which a couple of us have mentioned you know th that that was the best hope for creating an Asia Pacific grouping that China would eventually aspire to join and that could potentially uh, police a lot of these issues we've talked about. Uh, Stephanie Siegel from CSIS. Um, I want to go back to something that Secretary Paulson had mentioned as far as what is behind the tensions between the U.S. and China. And he did acknowledge kind of the uh, Chinese reluctance to reform um, over the past number of years despite this extended dialogue. But he also then focused on national security concerns. Um, and that seems to be related but a separate discussion from the economic issues. And even in the case of, of foreign investment, you mentioned the pretty significant drop off in Chinese foreign investment. That's been a function of reforms to FIRMA and a heightened degree of sensitivity to the sort of risk that's posed by China. Those seem like issues that are separate and apart from the trade and market access issues. And I don't see how those go away even if China comes to the table. So my question is how, <laughs> what would have to happen in order for those concerns to be addressed? And is there really um, a viable possibility that, that those issues are gonna be addressed in a way that actually prevents this sort of um, kind of bifurcation in the two economies? Right, so, so Stephanie, as I see it, you know, at the risk of oversimplification, I feel like we really have two kind of fundamental choices, right? So everyone takes the national security issue seriously, 
And my understanding of this is there's you know, certain technologies that have clear military application where we, we don't want the Chinese to be learning from us or stealing from us, et cetera. So option one is we think we can ring fence those technologies and continue to have a robust economic relationship with China, and I tend to fall into that camp. And then the, the other alternative is basically to say that pretty much everything has some kind of technology spillover with military applications. You know, it, we've kind of got away from the debate about decoupling, but there is a serious group in Washington who thinks that we should, you know, forget about negotiating openness with the Chinese. We should be deliberately getting our firms to withdraw and we should decouple and we shouldn't worry about China opening up more. We don't want to be involved with them because there's an authoritarian communist dictatorship, et cetera. And I just think that for economists, that second one is, is going to be very costly and it's just hard to see how you can have a stable, peaceful world. And so we have to make the first one work, take the national security issues seriously, tighten up investment restrictions as we're doing, you know, look at other relevant things, and then think about what technologies do we really want to ring fence and keep out of this U.S.-China relationship. Um, let, me, let me push a little bit on her, her, her question, because I, I think the, the principles uh, are, are clear. This is an application. So let, let's just deal with the, the most thorny case, which is Huawei, right? Um, some, some folks think Huawei equipment is so dangerous that, particularly in a 5G world, uh, if, you have five, if you have Huawei equipment or ZT equipment in the United States from handsets uh, to base stations, routers, uh, that that creates a national security vulnerability which is unacceptable. Um, I, I don't have the right answer whether or not that's true. Uh, maybe someone else here, here does. But um, should we take that concern seriously enough to contemplate the possibility that we might take, that we might ban uh, China's most successful high-tech company from our markets, even if uh, we might be going slightly too far and even if they might respond uh, similarly, with an American firm that's in China, whether or not they have the evidence or not. I'm, again, I'm trying to be devil's advocate. I'm trying to push the envelope here. But this is not something that isn't discussed in Washington quite a bit. And you have the National Defense Authorization Act, and we've got the executive you know, discussions about a possible executive order doing those kinds of things. So I think what we're trying to do is explore the boundaries of, of, of where this engagement or disengagement uh, goes. So. So on the Huawei case, I have uh, mixed feelings. On the one hand, uh, I think uh, they have been guilty of intellectual property theft, and I think uh, they do compete probably in a not always a level playing field. Nevertheless, there's, there's no smoking gun in terms of their uh, cyber uh, spying or anything. I mean, there is no proof that they embark on any type of a uh, cyber espionage, and at the same time, there is no proof that the Chinese cannot uh, penetrate uh, Nokia or Siemens, assuming that you develop the 5G network with non-Huawei equipment. So using non-Huawei equipment in the sense that it's for cybersecurity, while at the same time accusing China of cyber espionage is sort of a counterintuitive because you, you're saying that they can successfully infiltrate networks, but if you use your equipment, they can't. So I, it doesn't make much sense uh, to me in that sense. So I am not a strong believer in that Huawei, uh, banning Huawei would be a solution to, to cyber issues in the, in the future. Yes, um, thank you. My name is Phil Eskelin with Korea Economic Institute. Um, I have a question that maybe uh, if we broke down the wall, maybe we can talk about the WTO as well. Um, the Cato Institute did a study that analyzed um, the success rate on challenging Chinese practices at the WTO, and they, they lost every case that was there. Either they decided to change their policy before it went all the way to the final level, or they were you know, eventually uh, ruled against. So um, I was wondering, um, you know, Trump administration's approach is more unilateral, and then there's 
with the tariffs and then it hurts our economy. Would it have been better to almost start on like day one working with our other like-minded allies and pursue a case at the WTO and maybe by this time there would have been an initial ruling or even an appellate ruling and then China would have been forced to change its uh, behavior in a variety of areas. Let me just, uh, regarding WTO, I think uh, one of the ways China games the WTO is first, it lobbies very hard not to have cases brought against it in the WTO. So many industries are afraid of bringing a case to the WTO because China threatens them with repercussions if they are brought into WTO. So, so even before you bring a case to WTO, you're already losing. Then the WTO takes time. It takes a long time. And in that time, China can take a sizable advantages to the point that by the time there's a resolution, the industry that was being threatened may be probably put in a, in a, disadvantage, in a disadvantage that they will be hard to compensate for. So just measuring the WTO effectiveness by the number of cases won or lost by China, I think, misses the point of how China games the WTO. I would just add, I, I would be in favor of bringing more WTO cases against China on forced technology transfer, for example, and doing it with our partners. But I don't really disagree with Jorge that, you know, it would take a long time and it's not going to police all of these different issues that we're talking about. Uh, I, I think the record is of about the 20-some cases that have been brought against China. Um, they've lost almost all of them. Typically, the applicants win those cases. Uh, but nevertheless, very spotty implementation. So if you look at electronic payment services, which I mentioned before, um, China agreed by December 2006 to open. It didn't. The U.S. brought a case, uh, I believe, Ambassador Schwab. Uh, China lost, uh, went to the appellate body. China lost the appellate body decision in 2012. Here we are in 2019. Uh, Amex got a license a, a few weeks ago. MasterCard may get a deal. Maybe we'll get another. But that's pretty slow. And by the time Amex got its uh, license and MasterCard may get its license, China is completely now dependent on WeChat Pay, on Alipay. So, so these companies that were bringing the issue to the WTO were put at a disadvantage that they can't uh, compensate for now or overcome. Okay. Um, it's 11.41 by my iPhone's uh, account, and that means we've just got a few more minutes before we need to vacate, and they reassemble, they break down the rooms, and, and we feed you, and then we'll reassemble uh, back together with everyone. Um, a couple, of, why don't we collect a few comments uh, and ideas from the room, and then uh, we'll start here with Yancey, and then over here. Okay. Hi, thanks, Yancey Molnar with uh, Chubb. Um, more of a question for you guys. I'm, uh, I'll lead up to the, the question, but um, I'm wondering if there's room for a nuanced uh, policy towards China, or it's become so politicized that it's, you know, this uh, debate between decoupling and en engagement. Um, and, and going to this point of, you know, the technology issue um, and the security issue touching on everything, I, I was up on the Hill yesterday and, and uh, talking with staff, and, and this issue came up in, in terms of a U.S. cosmetics company having facial recognition technology, and should they be allowed to do business in China because China will use that technology for other purposes. Um, so if you're at that level, um, uh, you know, you're basically banning everything, as 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 David said. I mean, that if you you know you extrapolate that out, I mean, basically anything could be used in a nefarious way. Um, so you really need some kind of nuanced policy, and in this difficult political environment here, um, are we going to be able to do that? So with that background, I would love to hear each of your perspectives on five years from now. Where is the U.S.-China relationship going to be? Okay, we'll come back. We'll, we'll go in the the back of the room if we can as well, um, and then I we'll, actually, uh, go ahead.
All right, any final remarks? We'll come, yes. Hi, uh, Scott Thompson from Samsung. Uh, going back to the multilateral point, even if the WTO is indeed too slow, uh, putting bilateral solutions uh, on a multilateral problem uh, seems inefficient uh, at, at best, uh, given the seepage aspects of, to go back to that FedEx, FedEx example that Scott had, well, if there's a reciprocity, uh, on delivery services between the U.S. and China, then does German-based DHL just come in and take up all the business, and maybe Chairman Smith wouldn't like that outcome so much either. From Samsung's perspective, that has some theoretical appeal as a third country home base, but given the complexity of supply chains and what we do between U.S. and China, not necessarily so. So what are some multilateral approaches that actually could work, even if the WTO cannot, uh, if we want to maximize our effectiveness in this question without having to make countries and companies choose between the U.S. and China in a way that, as Dr. Dollar pointed out, they may well not want to have to do. Yeah. Would you like to comment, Fred? Would you like to comment on this question of whether or not, you know, how assertive, whether assertiveness in the U.S. and promotion of approaches like reciprocity might lead to uh, other uh, competitors from other countries taking business in China away from American companies? Do you want, can you, can you comment on that? And maybe we, we got a microphone right here because we're, we're on the internet. Well, I think the reality is that China, uh, early after coming into the WTO, basically made the decision to restrict foreign operators inside China, even though they had formally agreed not to do so. They did that by passing a law which was non-WTO uh, compliant, which basically reserved a part of the marketplace for Chinese operators, which was in between postal traffic, which was permitted to be excluded, and normal parcel delivery. And as Jorge said, we could have chosen to take that to the, to the WTO and go for years in doing that. So essentially what we attempted to do is to restrict our business into the um, intercontinental and multilateral shipping uh, space, and we're the only foreign company, I believe, that actually operates a domestic business inside China. But it's only because, as Hank said, we would never quit. Most of the people, as Jorge says, don't take it to the WTO because the Chinese take you behind the woods shed and rubber hose you. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I, that's not, uh, something that's vicarious. I know many companies that have made that decision not to go WTO complaint because of that. So it's a, uh, it's not quite as crisp, you know, that we can exclude you here and you can exclude there, but in essence, uh, a de facto version of that is what's underway today. Uh, Let thanks me just so say one other thing about Africa and some of the comments. One of the big uh, restrictions American companies have, and this is a good restriction, is our Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So we, we cannot and will not do things that companies from other parts of the world can and, and will do. Now that's a much better system and it keeps us, uh, you know, we've got a, a protective shield around us because when we get asked to slip the customs agent in uh, some unknown, unnamed European country, you know, facilitating payments, we just say we can't do that, we're a U.S.-based company. But that's a big difference in parts of the world, particularly in, in Africa. Chinese companies have no such restrictions. Super. Why don't we uh, give David and, and Jorge a chance for final comments and, and then wrap things up. Okay, so Yancy, I'll start with you. So I can't resist being an optimist, and I think the larger problem here is we've lost sight of the benefit of free trade, you know, linking to some of the other discussions occurring on the other side of the wall. I think we have, so I hope five years from now, America will have come to its senses and that we want to strongly embrace free trade and we want to partly do that by rejoining the TPP and expanding that as far as possible 
and creating a deeper integration where we address issues like IPR and services, investment data, et cetera. Now, the question about, just, you know, what if China views everything as national security? Well, then, then the hope that with that kind of uh, club, you know, the hope that China would aspire to join that, well, they actually, they won't aspire to join that. They won't want to do the data sharing and the opening of services, et cetera, et cetera. So I have no problem if we end up getting somewhat isolated from China because we've built a big integrated Asia Pacific market and China chooses not to be part of that, then I don't have a problem with that. But I think for us to start from where we are right now and say, let's decouple from China, I emphasized our partners are not going to go along with that, and that's going to end up being very costly. I'm going to <clears throat> address the, the other issue, which is the multilateral versus bilateral uh, approach. And I think uh, China games that system also very well, because as soon as there is a concerted approach uh, towards China, China is very good at nitpicking countries and offering uh, benefits to any country that breaks apart from that uh, coalition uh, to face it. So they, they're doing it with the EU with the 16, 16 plus one mechanism. They do it to Latin America all the time. So, so they're very good at that. So I think in a sense, it has worked. The fact that the United States just jumped in, did it as a bilateral issue. And once the US proved that they were willing to walk the walk, most EU countries, Japan, uh, started uh, falling behind and sort of saying, okay, we'll also address, but it's hard to do it in a multilateral approach because there's always the, the game theory temptation for a country to break off and, and try to get uh, certain advantages by being uh, the one that doesn't join the coalition. Well, um, I have to say this is probably the one conversation on China I've had in the last uh, year that I walk away modestly more optimistic than when I started. Uh, typically, it doesn't end that way for me. Uh, and uh, and I think that's because I don't talk enough to David and Jorge. And we don't have enough of these type of programs here at CSIS. Uh, and we're going to have more uh, because they're extremely important, uh, not just uh, this month uh, and in the negotiations with China right now, but we're trying to create a genuine positive agenda, uh, trade agenda for the future that uh, takes us well into the rest of the century. Uh, if you please join me uh, in thanking David and Jorge for helping us get this conversation going. Um, for, we have um, lunch out, outside. I hope that I haven't, we haven't made you have to wait longer than people in the other groups, but that just means you had a more productive conversation. So we'll, be, uh, we'll reconvene in just a little while. Thank you.